Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, our aim is to both uh, entertain you, um, but more importantly, uh, to give you some education. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be on autism or uh, ASD, uh, Autistic Spectrum Disorder. So let's get right into it. All righty. <clears throat> so let me start us off, Dr. Gutman. Is there a link between glutathione and autism spectrum disorders? And if so, where can we find it? Well, this is um, a, a great way to start. Um, I remember when I first started lecturing on glutathione, um, people would come up to me and say, um, uh, Dr. Gutman, um, does raising glutathione have anything to do with autism? And my answer would be, I don't know or no. And um, many people would would tell me, listen, I've, I've got a son, I've got a daughter, I've got a, a nephew, um, I've got a neighbor. Uh, they've been taking the Immunocal product to raise glutathione and um, their autistic uh, child has gotten better. Well, I found that interesting and I kept on hearing those stories, but when asked in a public domain on stage in front of hundreds of people, uh, does glutathione have anything to do with autism? I still would have to say, I don't know or no, because there, there wasn't any evidence that it did until, well, I'll let you guys go through this exercise yourself. Um, the website PubMed dot gov this is the foremost source of articles medical articles available in the world now a lot of people on this call today even uh, access this daily it's an essential tool for uh, the sharing of scientific information so for those of you who have not heard of this site um, it's critical for anyone doing research but i gotta warn you it's a bit of a rabbit hole that you might end up spending hours weeks or months at a time so um when we uh look at this chart here um i put in a search term with the two terms uh glutathione and autism and the graphic here shows the amount of papers written in different years um, from 1978 uh, up until the middle of the graph there really was uh, nothing written on autism and what's most noticeable uh here is that um there's this uh sudden spike in 2004 and boom and an avalanche of papers uh, started being published and why why all of a sudden what happened in 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 2004 that that changed my perspective on autism that allowed me to answer the question whether glutathione had anything to do with autism uh, what happened in 2004 well this ground bait breaking study was published it came from a team led by dr jill james uh many of you are aware of if if you uh, uh work in autism uh, working out of arkansas of all places uh, this was exceptional news to everyone in the autism research community and the paper was called metabolic biomarkers of increased oxidative stress and impaired methylation capacity in children with autism. Okay, now that's that's a bit of a, a mouthful, but let me just explain um, what they did. They collected blood samples of both uh, children with autism and children without autism and compared them for a whole bunch of different biochemical markers or blood tests. Uh, that related to uh, a, a metabolic process called methylation. Uh, now, again, I know some of you are familiar with these terms, but I want to be sure to keep uh, parents and non-scientists on, on on the loop here. And of course, oxidative stress is a, a reflection of the balance between antioxidants and free radicals. So they did these blood tests to look at methylation and oxidation. 
So uh, here you see a table. I, I'm sorry, it's impossible to to, to read here because the numbers are so small. But if you want to get into more detail, uh, remember PubMed.gov and and enter the name of the study in the search window. But let me give you the quick bottom line here. Hear this up. Just about 80% of the kids with autism had abnormalities in glutathione functioning. This is relevant, relevant information. 80% of these kids had abnormal glutathione. Wow. That's a, like, that is very significant. So if glutathione is so important, let's, uh, let's, let's take a look at that. What is, what is glutathione? Well, many of you already know this material, but again, there's going to be new callers on on all of these um, programs. Uh, we could spend hours uh, talking about this, and of course, I've written many books on the topic. But for those of you who are new, um, glutathione is a little molecule that occurs naturally in all of our cells, and the understanding of its many many roles is expanding every year. And getting back to PubMed, um, this slide is actually, I, I think, outdated by now. Uh, there's over 175,000 articles if you just enter glutathione in the search tool. Uh, just to, to, to put this in context, what does 175,000 articles mean? Um, if you entered vitamin C, you'd get back 70,000. Uh, vitamin E, gives you 45,000. So glutathione will get you more articles, more scientific medical articles than vitamin C and E put together. So anybody who's not heard of glutathione before, it will become part of our regular language in due time. So what does uh, glutathione do for us? Well, dozens of things, but if we can summarize uh, the four most important, you'll understand 90% of its role. Remember the word idea. Glutathione, what a great idea. I stands for the immune system. D stands for detoxifying. E stands for energy. And A stands for antioxidant. If we look at these in turn, um, glutathione can be perceived literally as food or fuel for your immune system. People who are low on glutathione have a weak immune system. P people who have normal uh, glutathione levels um, have a more optimized immune system. D for detoxification. Well, there are thousands and thousands of toxins in the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, and the water that we drink. We would uh, succumb to our environment um, in days were it not for the detoxification that takes place by glutathione. And the highest levels of glutathione to be found in the body is in the liver, which is, after all, your main organ of detoxification. Uh, we could talk about E, energy. Um, uh, our cells uh, derive energy from these little structures called mitochondria. And these mitochondria would literally burn up uh, from free radical damage were it not for a constant supply of glutathione. And A, uh, antioxidant, this is the role that most people recognize uh, for glutathione, and glutathione is referred to as the master antioxidant. And that's because all of the antioxidants we know of cannot function without the presence of glutathione. So glutathione, the master antioxidant. So Dr. Gellman, for the you know, listeners who are interested in the biochemistry here, could you take a bit of a closer look for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, but we won't we won't get too deep into it, but we'll dig in a little bit deeper. And uh, the slides that I'm going to show, uh, we will post um, 
a, a copy of this program uh, in a couple of weeks so you can study the slides at your at your own pace. I mean, here's one. Uh, uh, originally, I was going to get into several metabolic pathways where glutathione has direct relevance to uh, ASD, but I'm, I'm going to make it as brief as, as, as possible. Uh, let me just flash these overview slides onto your screen. So if you want, you can access these and look at them at your own pace. Uh, when the webinar is posted uh, later on. Uh, you'll see one pathway here, uh, circled in red, uh, where folate and B12 abnormalities relate to something called the MTHFR gene. MTHFR. Some of you have heard of that before, and it relates to a number of um, neurological disorders, in including uh, autism, and uh, very often we find a problem in that pathway with the MTHFR pathway. Uh, here's the methylation pathway, again, without getting into details. Occasionally, people with autism and other uh, neurologic diseases uh, end up with an abnormality in that pathway. And here is the common endpoint the transsulfuration pathway. And what that is, is the pathway in which glutathione production is made. That's where glutathione is made. So if you want me to walk through all of this in more detail, you can access an older lecture that I've uh, online on, the, on YouTube. Um, you could find it there at that address there. Um, uh, make sure you've got a nice stiff cup of coffee because uh, it's about an hour long. But it'll go through those pathways uh, for the keeners out there. So yeah, these are tough slides uh, for most of us. Uh, but just to refine this down to simpler terms, one, glutathione is intimately related to methylation pathways. Uh, glutathione is equally intimate, intimately related to MTHFR gene dysfunction. And I may suggest that the parents, um, if you're a parent uh, or, or a relative of a kid with, uh, with autism, uh, you may want to invest in an inexpensive uh, genetic testing that can determine uh, MTHFR gene abnormalities. It, it blows my mind that these are available online uh, for about $100. You know, it's, uh, uh, we see these uh, sites where you just spit into a bottle and they do uh, genes for you um, and tell you uh, ancestry, ancestry.com, places like that. Uh, it, to me, uh, for a 67-year-old doctor, this is still <laughs> science fiction. Uh, but you can get... Uh, the MTHFR gene examined and be able to um, almost predict whether there's going to be a problem. Uh, and number three, the blockages to glutathione production. Remember that last section there where glutathione is made. All of this stuff before it can be bypassed. It can be bypassed by providing bioavailable cysteine, which is the major precursor for glutathione. In other words, the problem may be in glutathione insufficiency, and we might be able to get around this issue by jumping into the pathway at a later point with a dietary intervention. Yes, a dietary intervention. In other words, uh, at the most basic level, uh, glutathione augmentation or raising glutathione appears to be an absolutely critical key intervention. So, Dr. Govan, this begs a question. How do you raise glutathione? Well, that's a, certainly a key question. Um, number one, you can't raise your glutathione levels by eating glutathione. When you eat glutathione, it becomes rapidly broken down in your digestive tract, and you just end up wasting your time and your money. Uh, glutathione needs to be made inside of your cells. 
So eating glutathione isn't going to make your cell manufacture glutathione. What you need to do is give your cells the building blocks, the specific nutrients your cells need to make glutathione, what we call precursors. So it's the use of precursors, such as immunocal, that allows the cell to make glutathione. And uh, here you see uh, two books that every pharmacist and every doctor in Canada and the USA use. Uh, the American one is called a PDR or the Physician's Desk Reference. And the Canadian one is the CPS, the Compendium of Pharmaceutical Specialties. And in there, if you're looking for a way to raise glutathione, you don't find glutathione because it doesn't work. You find two precursors, the drug NAC, N-acetylcysteine, um, which is a fantastic way to raise glutathione, but it, it does have significant side effects, and immunocal, a natural product that doesn't have the same spectrum of side effects and has the advantage of having a source of rich nutrition. Dr. Gubman, can you share some studies that have been done with immunocol? Um, I actually, uh, when I read the 2004 article um, that said that 80% of autistic kids were glutathione deficient, I, I, I got to work right away on putting together a study. Now you'll see that this study was published in 2008. Uh, in research, that's right away, <laughs> four, years, four years. And uh, so uh, I, I uh, did this cautiously. Um, it hadn't been done using a protein precursor before. Uh, so uh, you see the study oral tolerability on a cysteine-rich whey protein, a, a, a immunocal, in autism. And uh, we had to make sure uh, in any early study, you can't just launch into a major double-blind study. You have to make sure that it's tolerable, that it's safe, that there is no uh, downside. And so not only was it important to establish the concept was sound uh, and had the potential to be further investigated in larger studies, but there were challenges from the autism community about whether it was in fact safe. Uh, let me explain. Um, as many of you know, uh, selected dietary restrictions seem to show benefits in these kids. And certain foods have been shown to be potentially problematic. Uh, one type of food that was often eliminated was dairy or dairy products. And in my experience, many problems besides the ob obvious lactose intolerance surrounding dairy products lies in the casein content. Dairy products are very complex. They have many different types of, of peptides and many different types of proteins and other contents. And But usually the issue is found in the casein. A casein is just one of the many subproteins that you could find in milk. And uh, it represents the most common allergy, uh, but it does not show up um, in immunocal. And so, uh, yes, we, we proved that uh, it was, in fact, uh, safe. It was tolerable. And in the small numbers that we used, uh, we didn't reach statistical significance because we were small numbers, but these kids got better. These kids got better. So this was picked up um, by a fantastic group from uh, Nova Southwestern University in Florida. Uh, they took it to task. Um, they were impressed with the results and they wanted to do a large study themselves. Now, human studies in autistic spectrum disorder are, they're especially difficult. Uh, there's still no fully diagnostic biochemical endpoints. Um, the, the cause of autism is variable. Um, and the kids obviously require a, a different level of consent and on and on and on. Um, it, it took us 10 years. It took us 10 years to complete this study because of the uh, difficulties um, dealing with A, pediatrics, and B, uh, autistic kids. Regarding new evidence, Dr. Gubman, could I ask you to tell us about this new and seminal paper recently published 
and frontiers in psychiatry. Well, um, here it is. Here's here's a paper after after uh, ten years of study. Uh, it was led by uh, Dr. Anna Castajon, um, and uh, in, included uh, members of what's called the Mailman Siegel Center. This is a major autism research organization. Just a a, a, a ton of work uh, published in 2021. And an, an exceptional paper that you need to get your hands on. Uh, you'll see in the title um, that this human study was uh, randomized and double-blinded, placebo-controlled, and uh, all the other features of what's called a gold standard study. This is the highest level of research that you can do. Uh, the intervention that was used uh, was the glutathione precursor of Munical, uh, best described as a cysteine-rich whey protein isolate. So you see that all um, in the title. And uh, this uh, um, very busy slide uh, uh, looks at the behavior parameters that were measured. I'll get into that in a moment, but uh, again, I urge the researchers and clinicians that are listening to this to, to access that paper on PubMed, and uh, uh, you'll see the, the number here. You can uh, find it very easily. Uh, a, a simpler uh, graph uh, shows here um, glutathione levels. So clearly, glutathione levels were greatly improved. That's the uh, green box, and uh, as opposed to the red bar, which was the uh, placebo. So we 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 knew this was going to happen. We have so many studies showing that immunocal raises glutathione, but of course it's important to demonstrate that in autistic kids. So we've answered um, one of the major deficiencies shown in that original 2004 paper. And finally, the question that's much more important to the clinician, uh, to the parent, to the ch to the child, uh, are these kids actually feeling and doing better? How has this affected their quality of living? Uh, sometimes the pure scientists get too focused on lab results. Um, but the answer to those questions is yes. Uh, when we look back at the measurements pertaining to skills of daily living, uh, socialization, uh, reduction in mal maladaptive behaviors, uh, these get better across the board. And what's also important to note is that despite the efforts to randomize these kids into treatment of placebo groups, um, a close analysis of their behavior at the start of the study showed that the placebo group, um, before anybody got any um, uh, placebo or immunical, they, they, they scored slightly better uh, just out of chance. Uh, in other words, if the treatment group, group showed better scoring at the end of the treatment, that would imply that the intervention was even better than the numbers show. Now, here's where it gets a bit more complicated. There seemed to be a subset of autistic spectrum disorder kids that did much better than the overall population of autistic kids examined. Uh, this is important to tease out because since this is the first major study of its kind, it gives us information that perhaps there is a targeted group of autistic patients that may benefit more from this strategy. Remember, um, ASD, uh, autism spectrum disorder, is a very uh, mixed uh, phenomenon. So lack of a better term, we separated the groups into responders and non-responders, even though the non-responders responded, but not as well as the responders. Um, uh, so let's look at the, the two tables. Overall, these kids improved in the areas in the uh, blue label box, very promising. But look at the responders in the green lettered box. Look at the amount of statistically relevant improvements in behavioral parameters that resulted. Improvement in adaptive behaviors, communication skills, and, and even gross motor school skills. Uh, this uh, uh, needs to uh, be looked at even uh, closer. So the responders, they were generally older kids, 
And the responders started off with higher baseline glutathione levels. Um, uh, how do you uh, interpret that? Um, well, two things. Um, because the kids were older, remember, uh, the kids we were looking were between ages three and five. And clearly, a five-year-old is dramatically different than a three-year-old. And um, uh, let's just move on. Uh, because the responders were older, it may be that the intervention with the immunocal works better in older kids. Okay, so we, we need to look at that still, but this is our suspicion. Uh, the study would, would likely be even stronger if a larger age group, let's say three to eight-year-old children, um, would be looked at. And because the responders started off with higher baseline glutathione levels, um, number one, maybe there's a threshold where glutathione levels need to be so that these kids are functioning better and that the treated, the, the threshold was easier to reach with the dose that was supplied. And number two, which in my personal opinion has a strong likelihood, more kids would have shown a positive result if the dose was increased. And given that the intervention was so well tolerated and it's been on the market for over 25 years, uh, this, I think, is a reasonable suggestion. Uh, so maybe we need to use a slightly higher dose in autistic kids to get even better results. <clears throat> So if we want to find out more about glutathione, where can we go? Well, um, you can always go to PubMed <laughs> and look up these articles, but for many that will be challenging, it is a, a very dry uh, read, uh, something that's a little bit more accessible, um, of course, is my my book on, on glutathione, and uh, not hard to find. Um, uh, one place that uh, you can find it is on Amazon. Um, or Amazon uh, Kindle, where you can find individual chapters. Uh, some of these individual chapters, I believe there's one on autism as well. Um, I, I believe for certain members of Amazon Prime, um, they're free. 